Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Xena520, and welcome back to The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. In the last episode, we learned a startling truth about the nature of Koholint Island. And in this episode, we are not going into Faith Shrine, but instead, we are going to go take care of business elsewhere. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, this episode is post-commentated. Somehow, while I was in the process of recording episode 9 and 10, I lost the audio to episode 9. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. So we're going to start off by heading to Monbo's Pond and making our way back to maybe Village. Um, if I sound a little different, that's because I have a new microphone that I bought for a recording session with MacD. Uh, we finally got back together and recorded a new episode of... Well, not a new episode, but a new uh, session of... Uh, Serious Sam, uh, the first encounter. So that'll be coming up in uh, the near future. But before I did that, I wanted to record, well, this. Um, I had recorded episodes 9 and 10 of Link's Awakening, and when I went to edit them, I found I was missing a sound file. So, I had a scrapped recording before, but um, I must have forgotten to hit record. Anyway, here in the library, there's that book that's up on top of the bookcase that we can knock down with the Pegasus boots. Um, and that's the, the <laughs> that's the text for looking at a bookshelf. Anyway, uh, the book here only appears in the DX version. It speaks of a world of color underneath the gravestones. And then it gives you these this cryptic pattern. Three up, four right, five up to left one down I believe was the pattern anyway uh, that book's only there in the DX version of the game uh, the world of color only exists in this version so we're going to go back to the Monvo's pond and head into the graveyard where these five graves are at some point I'm probably going to have to uh, visit Crazy Tracy there and uh, get another potion because I keep dying to stupid things. Here is Crow or not. Let him fly away. Uh, avoid this guinea. Avoid it. Avo Just walk away. <laughs> and then we have to kill this one because you are unable to move the gravestones if there is a guinea alive on the screen. Guineas take far too long to kill for reasons I cannot fathom, probably because they're ghosts. But, uh, me trying frantically to get that rupee. Uh, pushing in the gravestones will cause a guinea to spawn occasionally. And then you have to go about killing it before you can push the gravestones again. I think I spawn a total of three guineas during the process of moving these gravestones. Uh, but guineas that spawn from tombstones, I believe, will always drop fairies. At least that's what seems to have happened here. Because I had that one that spawned from the gravestone, killed it, dropped a fairy. Kill this one. It also drops a fairy, and in the process I spawn the third one. And frantically swing my sword at it, trying to get rid of it, and it too spawns a fairy. So I am pretty sure that the guineas that spawn from gravestones are always dropping fairies. Anyway, you push the five gravestones in that orientation, and you are treated to a wonderful Game Boy Advance, or Game Boy Color remix of Zelda 1's dungeon theme. Uh, if you play Link's Awakening DX on a original black and white Game Boy Color, which you can do, uh, you have access to this dungeon. However, 
these two Stalfos, who stand guard here, exist so that unless you're playing on a Game Boy Color, you can't actually access the dungeon itself. Just this small room. Suddenly sword. Um, they are never in the same orientation, and if you do not answer the question correctly, uh, you won't be able to access the rest of the dungeon. I don't know if they kick you out or whatever, but we can now enter the color dungeon. Uh, the entire gimmick of the color dungeon is color. So we have these color goblins that hide on these beautifully animated panels. And we also have these turnstiles, which we'll come back to. These panels on the floor with this uh, hopping skull dude, I don't know if he shows up in any other dungeon in the game. But they will turn from green to yellow to red as you jump on them. And they'll bounce you around. And once after they've turned red, they'll turn into a hole. We've got these cannonball enemies here, which we will come back to. And then we've got more of these color goblins. I really wish they had done more with these uh, these animated panels, but they didn't. So sad face. Um, please hit me if I ever say that again. I really don't think these skull enemies show up in any other dungeon. And then something weird there happened with the sound. I don't know what that ha what that was, but we're gonna continue on. Anyway, uh, coming up here is our first mini-boss. It's this stone golem dude. What a greedy fool! <laughs> you want more power? A buffoon like you might as well give up and go home! He has... I guess you could say two attacks. His main attack is to do that ground pound thing and summon three boulders. Uh, the ground pound will knock you to the floor, um, and then he, after he does his ground pound attack, he will slowly walk forward. Uh, you can hit him at any point there, but you can only hit him once before he repeats his uh, attack cycle, which is kind of annoying. Um, I will put up on screen how many hits it took to take him down. I believe it's six. But it's just a really slow process. Um, there are two mini-bosses in this dungeon. One guards the Nightmare Door, the other one guards the Nightmare Key. Um, and if you could have seen for a brief second there, um, we are in level zero. Uh, this actually leads to the Nightmare Door. And then I get locked in this room with these turnstiles and no beak to tell me what the clue is. Uh, the clue is that you have to turn all the turnstiles from red to blue. And it takes me a couple seconds to figure this out because it will not work if you make them all red. It has They all have to be blue. All of them. This is almost painful to watch now. But there we go. And then I come to this room with these four zoles on these pan- uh, uh... Not panels. Piles. And a locked door. And I can't go any further. So, gotta go back. And then I come up here, where these zoles are get one inside me, get it off, and pick up a surprise guardian acorn I was not expecting, which cancels out the awesome music, unfortunately. Eventually the music does come back, but here's our map for killing all the souls. Looking at the map, the map is actually in the shape of a tunic, which will become important later. So coming back to these cannonball enemies, uh, the idea behind these cannonball enemies is that uh, you can knock, uh, hit them with your sword, 
to turn them into ball form. And then you can pick them up or knock them around so they go in the correctly colored holes. Um, and yes, those holes are actually holes. You can fall down them. And if you saw earlier with the blue one, they have a weird, like, freak out attack. Where they'll charge at you. But once you get them all in their correct holes, they'll drop whatever it is they need to drop, or they'll open a door, or what have you. So we're gonna head all the way back and deal with that other group of ball enemies. I kinda wish they had done something more with these enemies, but they only show up in this one dungeon in this one game. Which I understand why is because the, the Game Boy color was the, the gimmick of the hour. And I really wasn't expecting that ball enemy to hit the other enemy and knock him into a ball. Um, but here's our stone beak. Probably should have taken care of this when I saw it originally. <laughs> So we come back here, talk to this owl statue, and he tells us that, yes, you have to make all the red blue to solve the puzzle. And no, it doesn't work if you make them all red. So I go... I had the puzzle solved there for a second, but I screwed it up. But anyway, here's the compass. Wonderful compass. With the long-ass text box. And then we finally head up here, where there is... I don't think there's an uh, a tree chest here. No. But in here is another one of these turnstile puzzles, which also says make all the red blue. But there's another color in here now, too. There's a yellow. But it's still a pretty simple puzzle. Behaves very much like lights out. Color goblins. Oh, we ordered, man. And here's our second mini boss. Ooh, I am no weakling. Your pitiful sword is no match for me. This gel will turn into a buzz blob, who will shock you if you hit him with your sword, and will also periodically fire out these lightning bolts. Uh, he can fire them in a cross pattern or an X pattern. But what you're supposed to do is supposed to hit him with your magic powder, which will force him into gel form. And after three hits, or if he collides with you, he will turn back into buzz blob form. Take six hits to knock him out. And he will also drop a fairy. Pretty simple. It's not a challenging dungeon, it's more about the color gimmick than anything else. The only real problem is the boss itself. So here's the nightmare key on this uh, ominously placed chest between two statues. So now we can head back and access that other area. I hope you're tired of that sound, because I am. These guys have respawned. We can sneak up here. I have one arrow. I could have done this dungeon a long time ago. This is not the right way. I could have done this dungeon a long time ago, but I didn't because I thought it behaved much like the, um, the Hero's Cave from Oracle, from the Oracle games, which you can only access, um, you can only access that over time from the items you gra grab. Uh, but no, as soon as you have the Pegasus Boots, you can do this dungeon. So, here's a familiar en enemy. Blue is safe, yellow is caution, red is danger. This is a hard hat beetle from Link to the Past. He's able to fire these uh, cross-shaped energy beams. But the entire idea behind him is that you have to keep hitting him to make him change color. 
take too long, and he'll turn back. He goes from blue to cyan to green to yellow to orange to red. And as you may have noticed, every time you hit him, you are knocked away from him, which is a problem. So the idea is to get him walking in a certain area and pin your, get your back against the wall. Because otherwise you'll get knocked back and won't make it back to him in time to hit him. And then got him to green, and then he went to cyan again. Gone. Eventually, at a certain point, I grabbed my feather and started jumping over those things. He turned to this, like, lime color. And then the, okay, he turns to this lime color and then yellow. Then to the orange. Good job, you jumped on it. I almost died in this, in this fight. It's amazing. And now he's red. Yellow is caution. Red is danger. Take your time. And then he spawns to Stalfos to fight with him. And every time, and while he's red, he will continue to do this. As you can see, I almost die here. But I get up against the wall here and manage to kill him. At a freak stroke of luck. And he will drop a fairy as well. And in here, we have the Great Fairy, who admires us for coming this far, and offers to give us the power of color. Uh, she says if we want offense, all you have to choose red, or defense, choose blue. I, being the offensive powerhouse that I am, not really, choose red. The red tunic gives you double attack and the blue tunic will give you double defense basically it's like a permanent piece of power or a permanent guardian acorn however unlike the piece of power um, it will not make you go faster or allow you to pick up objects faster it's just strictly damage and it does the the sh throw enemies across the screen thing. Which is kind of cool. I can't remember ever picking the blue tunic. Um, the thing about the tunics is they also stack. So if you have the red tunic, like I do, and you pick up a piece of power, well, maybe the, uh, maybe you do pick up things faster. I think you do. You just don't move faster. Um, but if you pick up a piece of power, you now have quadruple damage. And if you pick up a guardian acorn while wearing the blue tunic, you now take quarter damage. Which is really strong. But that's why I like the red tunic, is if you have the red tunic and you pick up a piece of power and go in to fight a boss you basically mop the floor with the boss. Which is pretty cool. Now then. I'm not sure why I came in here. I do not know at all why I went in there. Anyway. I come in here, buy some arrows from good old shopkeep dude right here. He sells arrows for 10. He sells the hearts. I think I explained this already. What am I doing? Anyway, head back out. And we are now going to take care of something else. So. So, continuing on from where I left off here. We decide to head on to gather some secret seashells, which I was looking up off screen. So, I don't remember where exactly I went here, so we're just gonna have to see where I go to find out what secret seashells I grab. I believe the one that I picked up 
Oh, wait, I remember the one I picked up. Uh, the one I picked up is, um, if you recall, when we took uh, Mr. Ghost Dude back to his grave after visiting the house on the uh, cliff. He told us to look underneath a pot. But we never went back and did that. So we're gonna come through here, pass the banana guy, say hello to the monkey. He throws his coconut. Put this pot, uh, rock. And come down here to the cliffside house. And underneath the pot down here in the corner, there is now a secret seashell. This does not exist in the game until after you've returned the ghost to his grave. So that brings us to 17. Next, we're going to come over here. And head up to... Uh, I checked this, but this has already been taken care of. Unfortunately, yeah. That one's already done. I will be... Go a reminder, I will be going over all the secret seashells in the game. So, in case you're worried about missing any. There's one there, too, which I got earlier. Uh, this area here... This is one of the few areas where the bomb arrow... <laughs> ...comes into play. You shoot a bomb arrow across here, you can easily jump over. You're not actually supposed to be able to get over here until after you've gotten through level 7, I believe. Where you get your final item. And here, we've got fish. And we've got a staircase. The staircase leads us past this buzz blob to this other staircase. And here we find another well. Using magic powder, summons this bat guy. I do not remember what he's called, if he even has a name. Complains about waking up from his nap. Says he's gonna get his revenge. And then he tells us he's gonna let us carry more bombs. This allows us to carry double the bombs. And he also fills up our bomb bag. Bag, quote unquote. We don't actually have a bomb bag. But we now have the ability to carry 60 bombs. So we're going to warp back to Manba's Pond. And see where else my little guide takes us. One gripe I have about the uh, the menu system here, and I probably have said this before, but uh, the ocarina, the interface for it, is kind of annoying that it pops up immediately when you mouse or when you cursor over it. Um, they rectify this problem in uh, uh, Oracle, uh, yeah, Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages with uh, the, the Harp of Ages and the Seed Satchel and the Slingshot slash Seed Shooter item. Um, the interface does not show up until after, excuse me, until after you've selected the item to uh, put on your button. Uh, I've now picked up a Guardian Acorn, so I now effectively have the power of both the, uh, the Guardian Acorn and the Piece of Power, which is not usually possible. Anyway, we're going to come over here, jump in the water. Oh, I know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm heading back to Angler's Tunnel. Why? Because there was a chest that I pointed out early in the dungeon, and I never went back for. Um, I believe it only has like 50 rupees in it, but might as well show it off. There's a tunnel. 
and its wonderful remix of the cave theme. Hope you all enjoyed. I hope you're all enjoying the uh, the second narrator's remixes. Personally, I when I found out about them, I immediately downloaded the entire album and listened to it all summer. That's how good they were. Uh, I even let my mom listen. Oh boy. Look at that. Here we go. We now have times for damage. Plus speed. And fast pot lifting ability. Now, I don't really show it off too well here. Uh, yep, 50 roots. Ooh, will you stop yawning? But yep, kills a uh, P hat in one, hit, uh, one hit. Kills blue tech tights in one hit. This combination absolutely shreds bosses. It's amazing. But anyway, back in the water. I don't know why I'm not pressing the A button to swim faster. Hey, press the A button. Swim faster. You can do that when you're on the surface. Um, I already got what was in here. It was just a heart piece. Um, swim down here. Get out of the water. And then I believe I hook shot across the river? Yes. And immediately got sucked up by a like light. Luckily, the stinker doesn't grab my shield, so <laughs> we're good there. Break some Octoroks and find a one way passage. I'll explain this. Uh, the rafting minigame you come in here. Talk to the guy, pay some rupees, and you get the float down the river. And above the water surface, uh, in the rapids, which are basically like the quicksand of water in this game, uh, you can find flying items such as hearts, rupees, uh, magic powder, arrows, and bombs. And you can use the feather to leap off the raft and catch the items. And that's the entire purpose of the, uh, the minigame. Anyway, coming down here, this tree here to the right of the, uh, the phone booth. If you charge into it, there's a secret seashell in it. That brings us to, I believe, I'm going to say 18. Me having trouble with this uh, wing doctor rock here. 18, yes, we need two more. So, head back into town. Where are we going to go now? we gonna go now back down to the beach apparently Some sea urchins oh I know where I'm going so here we're finally going to f get the reward for uh, the trading sequence this cave before was empty, but now that we have the magnifying lens, we can see there's a Garaya in here. And if you talk to him, he says he found a good item washed up on the beach, and that he'll trade it for whatever we have in our B button. The shovel is a useless item at this point, so we trade our shovel for a boomerang. 
The boomerang is, without a doubt, one of the most OP items in the game. It kills levers. It kills crabs. This is not a stunning boomerang. This is a full-on Australian boomerang. This sucker kills. And we'll get into later just how powerful this boomerang is. Uh, one of the few enemies it cannot kill, however, is... I think the Buzz Blob is one of the few enemies it cannot kill. I think I tested here. No, wait. Um, it's the Hook Shot that can't kill Buzz Blobs. But the Boomerang... Can. The boomerang can kill those guys. And collect the fairy that they have at the same time. Which is pretty neat. The boomerang is kind of a big deal. And that's kind of the item kind of item you would expect <laughs> from a lengthy trading sequence that lasts the entire game. Pretty much. Uh, those winged mushroom dudes, I don't know what they're called, but I do know that they always drop fairies. With the boomerang, it's super easy to kill them and get the fairy. So what we're going to do now, I believe... <laughs> what we're going to do now is head up... Or, no, we're going to head down. I, I'm not sure why I did that. Uh, we're going to head... Oh, we're going to head back to the animal village. And grab another photograph. So this other empty house here... Uh, yeah, this woman is sweeping in here now. But in here, if you enter, you come over to the water. And now there's a Zora! who says that we can only see him because he has a ma because we have a magnifying glass and that he's not a troublemaker he just wants to live in peace and then the photographer shows up and decides to take a picture so i found zora <laughs> and that face on link that absolutely ridiculous face that link has So, I believe now, maybe, we go and try to find, um, our, uh, missing, missing, uh, seashells, perhaps. Oh, nope. Nope, this is where I ended it off. Alright, so, next time, <laughs> in... The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX. We're going to uh, venture into Face Shrine. See you guys then.